If I haven't met you before, my name is Dietrich. I work at Protocol Labs on the browsers and platforms team with some of the folks in this room. I've worked with a bunch of the people in this room. And the browsers and web platform track is going to be a little bit about what's happening with IPFS and web browsers today, what's happening with IPFS and HTTP generally, uh, the world of browser extensions. We'll cover some things like bridges between Web 2 and Web 3. Uh, and a few more forward-looking things and some of the challenges that we have around the network stack as, as well. Uh, but to kick it off, I'm going to start off with a little bit of where things are. Here's what we've done, here's what we've been. This is uh, kind of like just triangulating what our team does. We're not just browsers. We do things extra browser as well and a bunch of other things related to Filecoin libraries tooling. Um, You've probably seen this slide before. I think I've showed it four times in the last two days, but it's a pretty good, yeah, it's a mostly accurate state of things with regards to browsers and the web today. Uh, there's a, like, an entire universe of like uh, alt browser, I guess, alternative browser that's really exploding right now. And we're going to hear from Movon uh, about Agrigore later. Uh, but there's all kinds of like, really, I'm just seeing a huge amount of um, activity and investment around things that are not these browsers. And that is super, super exciting. And that's something we're, like, we're not really going to get into much today, but I encourage you, like, join our Browsers and Platforms channel on the Filecoin Slack. It's also bridged to Matrix, also bridged to the IPFS Discord. And we talk about a bunch of those things. Whenever we see new browser-related things or web-related things, we drop them in that channel and hang out and chat about it. So you are welcome to join that conversation. Uh, th this is way more green than I think I expected it to be, even after being at PL for just over three years. We've made some pretty significant strides. We have some very aligned partners in browsers like Brave, but also some areas where um, in some of the biggest browsers, you'll see a lot more red. And you know, there's a, a number of reasons why, why that is. Uh, everything from architectural differences to uh, our, uh, lack of participation in standards bodies and things like that. Um, but some oddly interesting uh, supporters, champions, and strange places as well. And so I'll cover, I'll cover a little bit of that. Uh, from a challenges standpoint, there's a lot of them. Uh, the way that you know, uh, the HTTP trust and security models work, the privacy models work, are really par paradigmatically different than how we envision trust and security in IPFS. Uh, the composability of IPFS and the you know, stack all the way down to the bottom uh, is a radical re-envisioning kind of of how you would build an internet. Um, as opposed to maybe just the www part of the web today. And that means that there's uh, no, no shortage of places where we might have differences, uh, either architecturally or from some of these really specific sticking points when it comes to privacy specifically. The IPFS public network is exactly that. It's public. You can see everything that happens on it. Uh, but oftentimes, too, there's a, 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 a gulf between the, the places in which uh, we are coming from and the end user problems that we are trying to solve when we are looking to implement our protocols inside web browsers and make them more broadly available to application developers and to publishers of data uh, than the uh, you know, traditional, I guess it, the institutional web is not the right way to describe it, but the set of people who are decision makers at standards bodies today around what browsers can and cannot do. Um, so a lot of this comes down to a ongoing clash of cultures and philosophies and politics around what the web should be uh, who and who who even gets to decide that um, when somebody like the the you know amount of skepticism and f almost fear in some places around using the phrase web 3 is really telling around that who has or who or how many people have their hands on the ability to change what the definition and, and, and meaning of the web is if you spend some time reading through uh, a very interesting document uh, written by the Technical Architecture Group, the W3C, which is called the Ethical Web Principles. It's very interesting to look at that document and look at the web as it is today, the, web, the HTTP web, and look at the vision that it paints and what some of the protocols like ours are trying to do, how much similarity there is there, yet from a value standpoint and from a technical architecture standpoint, universes apart. 
Um, and and that, can, that can be challenging, but, but also interesting. At, at base, you know, I think a lot of the way that developers think about the web and what we're trying to do is a little bit like this, even though, um, as Martin will show us, it's a little more complicated than this these days, even when developing HTTP. And when we're approaching the problems that we want to solve in browsers today, that we want end users to be able to really access, really lower the barriers to be able to access architectures like this, where if you're in the same room, you can build applications that work together and, and talk to each other without having any data having to leave the room, which, which with DNS is basically already impossible for the most part, um, unless you're hacking things locally. Uh, and really like thinking about how humans interrelate on the internet and how can we build applications that connect them in ways that really slowly telescope out in, in this way. And architectures that support this like a mix and matching type of ways that people can communicate with each other. It's, it's really not easy and it's a difficult thing to communicate this to people who really fundamentally, even though the network doesn't operate like this, still think about it like this. And that, that's a challenge, not just you know, socially, but also you know, technically and, and politically. Um, I, I've done a talk called IPFS in Weird Places, and honestly, like, they're just not that weird. And one of the interesting things about the areas and the environments that our team codes to is that when you look at a list like this, when you think the web, you think browsers. But really, the web ends up in all of these different places. And I, I removed a few that you could maybe stretch and argue that the web gets into IoT and satellites a bit. But the rest of these, you really, you're like, all right, yep, the web is in almost all of these other places and pretty deeply. Uh, one of the groups that we work a lot with, and I'll talk a bit about it, is Agalia. And they are the maintainers of a embedded WebKit implementation. And that's a web rendering engine that renders the user interface that you see on washing machines and refrigerators and coffee machines and one of the probably most of the most widely deployed web rendering engines in the world, but nobody's ever really heard of it. Very few number of contributors. It's not really considered the, you know, we can't interact with it in ways that are outside of that appliance generally and that changes the nature of how accessible it is to us as builders or people who, who want to solve end user problems that are relevant to us and, and our mission. But um, the web is broader than just browsers. And that means more challenges sometimes, but also some opportunities. And so we really kind of lean, lean into that as well. Um, also, and, and really, like that's not well represented in this, right? Like when we think about browsers in the web today, we kind of think of these very familiar icons. Um, I guess I probably should have put the Safari icon up there instead of WebKit, and more people would have recognized it. Um, but the web really does expand far, far, far beyond these, these set of entities. But those are what I'm going to talk about today, is what the gains that we've made, some of the things that we've actually shipped over the last couple of years, and then hand it off to other folks to talk about new directions that we're going to go, um, new challenges that we're trying to tackle. Um, so Opera Browser was the first major browser. They say they have about 250 million users uh, worldwide. And if you're like, well, I don't know anybody that uses Opera Browser, it's because most of their users are in other places like televisions and other different types of appliances or Opera Mini on smart feature phones, uh, things that aren't maybe things that you and I hold in our hands every day, but billions of people around the planet do. Uh, so it's a very interesting company in that regard. So they shipped IPFS and IPNS scheme support where it redirected to a remote gateway to like before anybody else did. And they actually did it across their iOS browsers, their Android browsers, and their desktop browser. Um, uh, the company itself has been bought by a investment conglomerate, so there's not really like a, a lot of the people who are like deep web um, champions that were at Opera for many, many years have now since moved on to other companies. Um, but there's still some, some folks there, and we try to keep the door open and take advantage of these opportunities as they come about. Um, but there's not really a lot happening right now. It's definitely, definitely slowed down. Uh, Firefox. I was there for 13 years building Firefox web browser back in the day, Firefox OS, mobile operating system, and then I spent the last four years doing developer relations and strategy. So working on things like MDN, doing a lot of talks, and building out kind of community developer relations groups like the Mozilla Tech Speakers. Um, I was, had a side project there to add APIs to the browser that were like the common denominator that you would need for browsers to be full participants in distributed systems like IPFS. Uh, so it added things like TCP and UDP socket support, protocol registration, actual file system access to browser extensions. Because we'd had some early experiments, like a, a technology called FlyWeb, which kind of added the idea that a web page can itself be a server 
to the web platform directly as a web API. And from a security standpoint, that just got shut down really fast. So we said, okay, what if as an, like a, a way to do some innovating in this space, we added extension APIs instead. And that allowed a little bit more kind of explicit user consent and a model for that, for those elevated privileges that you have from an extension. Um, there's a lot of interest for in you know, the DWeb world and projects like uh, you know, Ethereum folks and IPFS, super interested, but there were not really a lot of support inside Mozilla to be able to develop that. And that's one of the challenges that we still have today is that even though Mozilla has a lot of value alignment, when you look at like the, the mission of, of protocol labs or IPFS or something like that, and you look at uh, like right next to the Mozilla mission, you're like, hey, blew your eyes. Like these look kind of similar. Um, but from an architectural standpoint and the what does it mean to be part of the web standpoint, they're really universes apart. And there's not really a lot of interest there to be doing the kind of experimentation that we want to do in browsers today. So you know, we haven't really made a lot of ground there. Um, and maybe even backwards, uh, when it comes to things like the, even something like the DID spec at the W3C, where Mozilla is one of the formal objectors, objected to the group being formed and objected to it being a proposed um, standard at the W3C. So a lot of a lot of friction in that relationship, but also some opportunities, and still obviously talking to folks there on a pretty regular basis. Um, WebKit and Apple, no, no clear signals from Apple. Uh, you know, we know some of the developers on the WebKit team. We know people that work in other parts and try to keep some back channels open there, but um, not really a lot of direct engagement. So uh, we worked with Agalia to do some things like um, interoperability of local host security model handling in WebKit. And even there, we just really a lot of walls and really difficult to make change. Um, so it's very slow going, but you know, of course, maybe the broader environment changing around them sometimes can have like three to five year effects on the decision making that Apple makes about the web. And what we've seen recently is like they've hired up a bunch of people that work on WebKit and Safari and have really accelerated things like PWA support and uh, also, the movement in European Union regulations around allowing non-WebKit rendering engines on iOS, I think also might want to be one of those levers that get things moving a little bit. So uh, definitely an, an, a place to watch, but really not a lot of material happening. Uh, Brave is one of the, you know, as the name implies, they are very interested in taking big experimental risks with what the nature of the web is. And that's a big opportunity for us. So we've known folks there for, for way back, for going way back. They bundled IPFS extension what, over three years ago at this point now, or the IPFS companion extension. Um, and since then, we've really engaged more deeply. We have a engineer embedded on their team who only focuses on things related to the work that, that we're doing. And so now we have IPFS and IPNS scheme support. We have a whole bunch of other features like kind of peripheral to these. We have um, interesting experimentation and work in the security UI of the browser. So basically every time we take one of these non-HTTP protocols and we put it in an HTTP place, you have to think about what you visualize to the user so that they can make decisions that keep them safe. And that's kind of what the browser's job is. And I think if you don't work on browsers full time, you don't really think about it that way, but there's huge teams of designers and security experts that work together to come up with the things you never really even notice might be in a URL or address bar in a browser. Every little piece of user interface there is, is intricately designed, very intentionally designed, and for there's a lot of a lot of human hours go into thinking about what each bit of that user interface means when it comes to end users making decisions about whether they should put their credit card into that page, whether they should be able to post data there or not. Can you trust it or not, or not really is that calculus that every end user of the web has every time they load a page. And it's one of the reasons why we have to take great care, uh, even when we're working with the bravest of experimenters, in thinking about what that user interface looks like. So we've done some great work with them. We're gonna be adding a whole bunch more things like NFT features, and we just added uh, Filecoin support to their native, native uh, wallet in the browser. And there's more stuff that we wanna do, especially in the area of moving Web2 data onto IPFS, or allowing end users to be able to capture and save Web2 data in a way that Let's them share it with other people, save it locally, th things like that. So more to come there. They now have, they're growing really, really fast. So I think yes, uh, last week it was 62 million monthly active users and 20 million daily users. So as a um, person who worked as, at a, not the default browser at an operating system for a long time, it's difficult to underscore how much of an accomplishment that is from a user acquisition and growth standpoint. It's, it's unbelievable how fast they're growing. So it's, it's really good that we have a good relationship with them and we can do things together. Um, 
So, and, and this is kind of what I was talking about, like some of the things that work, but then also some of the places where we have to be very, very careful. Uh, HTTP things and not HTTP things co-living together, it, it can get awkward in the same space. Um, Chromium, and, you know, I think it was what, like over 90% of the web today ends up being Chromium uh, rendering engine under the, under the covers, regardless of whatever the top level project product is, and then uh, Chromium, Chrome browser itself being a massive share of, of browsers now. We work with Agalia, and so Agalia is a consultancy. They've worked on web rendering engines for about 20 years. I think they had their like 20-year anniversary party last year. Uh, they've added a bunch of accessibility APIs to the web. They've worked on things like MathML. They've worked with a number of uh, CSS Grid for Bloomberg. They've done a bunch of things, though most web developers may have never heard their name ever. But you might, very likely, if you are a web developer, has used, have used code that they've written. Uh, they contribute to WebKit, Gecko, and uh, Blink, and they they are um, part of the, like the deciding, the decision makers of the web a little bit. They participate in the W3C for a long time. Um, and so we have a contract with them where we have a full-time team member now focused on all the things that we want to do on the web. So we want to be able to add uh, the ability to register non-HTTP protocols to Chromium-based web browsers. They worked with us on that. Um, they've worked with us on a, a bunch of like security and compat issues. How do we make sure that uh, that let's say Gecko and uh, Blink handle uh, schemes the same way that they handle local host security restrictions the same way? Everything from permissions uh, up and down the stack. And we're talking about things like adding native IPFS support to the Chromium network stack and kind of poking at what that might look like. Because right now the approaches that we take in, uh, like for with Brave for example, was to ship Kubo in Brave, or basically alongside Brave, and Brave manages that external process. Uh, you don't get the security model of the web or it, deep integration of the web when you go that route. Um, even if you if you redirect to the remote gateway, you can maybe go an oddly HTTP-ish path up and down the permissions stack, but it's not really native. And we really want to reimagine what native IPFS support in the web would look like. And to be able to do that in Chromium, you have to embed directly into their network stack as opposed to being a bundled vendor library, where at some point, like the permissions and security models and feature capability detection models and all that forks and goes the HTTP path versus the IPFS path. And so one of the first major projects that we did with them was a refactoring of the Chromium code base to be able to unify how protocols and schemes are handled up and down the stack. Everything from ha like ha handing off to the graphics pipeline, security checks, CSS engine, all of the different parts of these things that are basically operating systems of themselves at this point, really, really massive code bases and really massive communities of developers. And with Chromium specifically, a large community of businesses that are also building on it are all part of like the decision-making tree and the daily, you know, operations of developing the thing. And so Agalia has been our kind of representative in that way. And we haven't really poked so far at, at things that are specifically IPFS, but we're just about to turn that corner. So I think it's gonna be interesting like next six to 12 months as we lean a little harder into doing actual IPFS things with them in Chromium, as opposed to just kind of smoothing out the bumps or creating space for non-HTTP protocol development. Uh, IPFS Companion, you're going to hear a little bit today probably from Lytle and also from David Justice about where it's been and where it's going. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there um, other than it's, it's a really challenging environment. Like web extensions were first many years not compatible across browsers. Now they're like generally compatible across browsers, but the kind of like capability and feature space has really decreased in size um, with a, a couple of major changes. And, and Dave will talk about those changes, but it's made it really difficult. And it means that it kind of makes us have to reevaluate what is the purpose of an IPFS extension? Uh, what can an IPFS extension be? What can it do in that available space where instead of kind of like fighting what that space has to offer, how can we lean into what that space has to offer? Um, maybe using it as a broader acquisition channel for users or really verticalizing what IPFS can bring to the extension space by doing things like maybe like iHeart Wikipedia extension where it's not directed towards IPFS users, it's directed towards Wikipedia lovers who want to click a button and support Wikipedia by saving and serving a copy through the IPFS network. So really rethinking what we do in, in the extension space. Um, so <laughs> what comes next? Uh, you're going to hear it today from a couple of different speakers looking at how we can do deeper integration, uh, building alternate browsers, like ones that are not household names that you recognize, but might provide the capabilities and features that we really want to see, doing experimentation there. Um, the Web 2 to Web 3 upgrade path. So while we can build a new web, 
how do we ensure the safety and, and accessibility of all of the bazillions of web pages that have existed since 1994, five, six onward as the usage really started to explode? Um, we're doing some work with Old Dominion University and Internet Archive that measures what the average lifetime of a web page is going back to the beginning of the web. And just even in 1996, trying to find a million web pages was really, really not easy. And so we're, we're measuring like, what is the level of threat of the web today, of the, of the HTTP web? How long is data actually available when you publish a web page? Does that data get published and then die? Is it taken down? Does it move? Does it shift? Uh, how can we have a record of the human experience over this last 30 years and preserve that moving forward? So we're pretty interested in, in connecting these worlds in interesting ways too. And we might hear a little bit about that from the Web Recorder Project. Uh, and then you know what you've seen really this weekend, or this week was experimentation with new IPFS architectures. So really re-envisioning what IPFS can be when it's not just a monolithic daemon running on a fully capable you know, desktop or enterprise class server system. What does it need to be to be able to serve some of these environments? You'll see people asking those questions and also some of the ways that they've developed. Um, so that's the short view of where browsers are today and then some hints of where things are going to be over the next six to 12 months. Thanks. <laughs>